Contrary to what the wall clock says, it is five o'clock on Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. And this meeting of the Beltrami County Board of Commissioners will come to order. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have no general comments. Uh, any citizens wishing to address the board? Seeing none, move on to approval of the agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda, uh, but add, well, we already pulled item 7. Yes, yep. And as the last item of business, uh, Closed session regarding the district in Boston. For what purpose? There's really nothing to discuss. It's it's in the judge's hands. I, there's there's to nothing the to discuss. Except the judge does make a decision by the end of this month. There's going to have to be a plan. Yeah. Ifs and buts. You know. I, I see no need for a closed session. We don't want to prep and plan if the uh, uh, judge doesn't rule uh, by the end of the month. If he doesn't rule, then we'll 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 deal with that. Yeah. Well, if he doesn't rule, it stays. Like, it stays the way it is. Yeah. As far as I, I know, yeah. when we dealt with that, that was a legal map and. Mm -hmm. We could certainly add item 12B and we could have a discussion about what we think we might want to do, but I, I that's certainly it's, fine with me, but I, I, we certainly don't need a closed session over it. No. I don't well, think we even need to talk I, about I, it. I don't think we do either, but. It's such a arbitrary thing. We don't have any idea what, you know, the judge could rule with something totally different too. We, we'd have no idea. Richard, Alluded to oh, probably consider. I mean, there's a lawsuit still, so that's why I suggested the closed session. I think I think that uh, right now, Commissioner, we could we have time to work with that. I do too. But there's no so, board meeting between the next board meeting that's May seventh, mm -hmm. and that's the day we need it by. So if we don't get it by then, we can deal with it that day. We need it 14 days prior to the 21st, which is May 7th. No, May 7th is the last day that we need it. I tell we you need what, it by. Jody, can you come up to the podium, please? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, Jody, but really in the uh, instance that a judge doesn't make a final ruling by your, the deadline that you need it by, what is there that we can do anyway? Is there any? <laughs> I believe that when the judge signs off on the plan, he he has to come with another set of orders on how it's implemented if it doesn't make it by that time. Um, I believe because of the lawsuit and the ruling of the lawsuit, this has been taken out of the board's hands. This is the commission, the um, redistricting commission, along with the judge, making all determination on what happens going forward. So it's pointless for us to even try to think about an alternative plan or anything else. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you, Jody. Yeah. <laughs> What's the, what is the final date? That's the uh, deadline. Filing period it starts May 21st and May 7th is 14 days prior to that. That's when Jody needs to have it to send off to the state. So, so if we had to absolutely decide something, we could have the next Potentially could at the next meeting. But I, I don't know that there's anything for us to decide anyways, Commissioner Gould. So, Mr. Chair, I would make a motion that we uh, approve the agenda with the following change, moving item 7D from the consent agenda down to item 12A, and that is for the approval of the per diem, the commissioner's per diem policy. And with that motion, uh, that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Richard. As changed. As, <laughs> as changed. <laughs> okay. I'll second it. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are on to the April 24th timber auction results. Your last timber auction to present to us, Mr. Moore? <laughs> yes, it is, in fact. My last one. Don't smile that much. <laughs> no. Hey, the good news, look, good, good afternoon, commissioners. Good news was we had a real good turnout. 35 to 40 different attendees were there, and Commissioner Gould came to observe. And I think you got a good feel of how it went. Um, actually took a half hour, which is longer than usual because we had a couple that, well, they all went up pretty high. So that's good news to present here. So I'm darn glad I've got good news to come forward with. Um, and I want to just point out we um, the Aspens, could you put that one slide up, please, Diane? When we sold everything, you know, like I said, 35 to 40 people and it was a crowded room. And then I just wanted to pass on, we made, uh, we sold $466,000 worth of timber. So that's right on par. It's about a third of what we've got. So if that keeps up, we should be around that 1.4 million for this year. We were 1.5 million last year and hopefully we'll be about the same. It's kind of hard to judge after one, um, one auction. But just to let you know, and I know you've got this in front of you on one of those, I did the math, 64% of our sales is in Aspen. You know, I never really broke it down in as long as I've been here, but for this auction, 64% was Aspen, 20% was red pine. So those are the two species that are really carrying uh, the load and selling well. So that really only leaves about 16% for all the other species, you know, the dozen or so, but Aspen is still our bellwether. And that's what I kind of wanted to bring up here with that um, to show you what the um, average stumpage price per cord was of which it was 4391 um which is slightly above last year but it's right in range there so so things are kind of stabilized here you can kind of see how things were dipped a few years ago with everything uh how much it dipped down but you know the last three years it's remained kind of stable and that's encouraging you know as long as all the mills stay in business and everything works out so so it's staying stable which is all we can ask for and I guess that's the report I just wanted to give you. Um, good attendance, good sale, and Aspen staying stable. Those are kind of the three highlights that I'd like to bring forward on that. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Commissioner Gould, how did you like that? Was that kind of fun, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Very good. <laughs> awesome. And uh, Dick, they have two years to, to do that cutting, correct? Correct. That's our average. You know, we have some sales that if it's a winter sale, we'll go three, at least three winters. So sometimes that's two and a half years, but usually we can count on two years. So, but we had a good, good one last year. So we're seeing some of those coming in this year. So this year should be good, but you just never know how I hate to stand up here and make any promises, but um, things are looking good. And that's what I want to leave you with. So the question I have for you though, is with, is without having a really cold winter, did it really um, hurt the loggers getting out into some areas that they normally would be frozen? Yes. It Is did. that going to impact anything for the future for us on that? Or It won't if we have a good season, if we have a good winter next year. I think they'll get in there and hopefully, you know, they like to try to plan their winters. And obviously they don't know how long a time they're going to have to cross some of these swamps and get to some of these frozen areas. So it could hinder a little bit if they have to try to do like one and a half to two winters work in one winter. So if it's a good winter, I think we should be okay. But if it's kind of a dicey winter, it, it's going to affect harvesting operations. Absolutely. So, cause yeah. they were moving on to some summer sites, ones that they like to save for the summer, they moved on to the past winter just cause they could get at it and they couldn't get to some of the other ones. So. I, I, yeah, I was just going to say that I talked to a logger the other day and they cut some summer sites or, you know, in the winter time. Yeah, they're even in some pine sites, which usually are strictly summer sites, but they had to do what they do to keep cash flow going. You know, you, you got you to gotta work with them. So, Any other questions for Dick on the timber sales? 
Okay, moving on to the easement and land exchange. Okay, this is kind of interesting. I promised Commissioner um, Sumner I'd come back with a update for the Williamson um, exchange. And I did some research and I do, I've only done about five of these in my career here over 13 years. And I'd kind of forgotten, but I do not need any resolution anymore from the county board. We've already had two that's been approved to move this all through the process. But I wanted to give an update on where we are at with, with the exchange. And what happened or what we kind of bumped into is we found out the you know, it, it, county attorney's office um, saw this. There was an easement granted in 1990, I believe, to Kevin Williamson's father, Murray. And it's kind of ironic that it was only granted to him and it didn't say anything about any successors or heirs or anything. So by the letter of the law, the only person who had legal access back there across our property was Murray, the father. And now obviously Kevin is the one that's gonna be um, involved in land exchange or is involved in land exchange. So we had to come up where I came up with the replacement easement. Murray already paid for one, even though it was 34 years ago. I think we can just give one at no charge except for the recording fee to Kevin to make sure everything's in line for him accessing the property that he's exchanging with us. So that's what I'm bringing forward in front of you here and why it's a no charge because they really already paid for it. There wasn't any malfeasance or anything um, as far as that goes. So that's why I would like that approved. And upon a, um, approval, like I say, it's right at the very bottom, if you're reading along with me, if the new easement's approved by the county board, the DNR will conduct a full review in Bemidji, and then they also ship it down to St. Paul for a full review. And everything should be in place, because I did already send it to DNR to kind of give a quick look at it to make sure I didn't miss anything. And then it would go to the land, the state land board, May 23rd or August 14th, depending on how fast things can get through the system between Bemidji and St. Paul. So this would be finalized either in May, because they only meet four times a year, this uh, land exchange board, the state. So it would be May 23rd or August 14th, and that's what I wanted to bring forward, forward to you. So everything's worked smooth. We actually got it done in a year and a couple of weeks, which is pretty darn good for a land exchange. So I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Dick. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thank you. Moving on to the Northern Township Access Permit. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> wanted to put an access agreement with a soil boring permit in front of you tonight. This is something that uh, Northern Township's representatives have come and presented on in the past. Uh, as you know, they've been trying to uh, expand uh, their water and sewer capabilities, and in particular, sewer the northern part of Lake Bemidji. They're working on this project for uh, you know quite a while, a number of years actually. And uh, they found a parcel uh, that the county actually owns, kind of in the eastern side, northeastern side of Lake Bemidji, uh, that they'd like to um, gain access to and do some soil borings on. Originally, this parcel and the idea. I should say around uh, the sewering of the northern part of Lake Bemidji was to develop a sewage lagoon uh, that fell through. And so now the the township is looking at developing a mechanical plant with a direct uh, infiltration uh, capability. So uh, this site has the potential to satisfy that need. Uh, but in order to know specifically, they need to have access to the site and bore it so that they have the suitable soils that will actually take the infiltration. Uh, so we've put together an access agreement for Northern Township, which is before you now. Uh, with your approval, it would go into effect today, essentially, and uh, remain in effect until the end of this year. The permit and access uh, permit, or I should say the permit and access agreement does uh, require them to, you know, take good care of the property, restore it in its original condition, hold us harmless, uh, uh, you know, assume liability, those types of things. All the standard agreements, um, it has been signed by the chairman of the of the township and also uh, the um, clerk. And so it's before you this evening for consideration. I, I will say that if the site does look promising, I know we're going to be putting some money into this. And so 
uh, they'll probably ask the board to consider either leasing or selling the property in part or in whole. So um, if that's something you're not interested in, you probably want to say no now so we don't get their <laughs> hopes up and they don't put a lot of time and money and effort into evaluating the site only for the board to maybe not be open to that idea in the future. So you don't have to make that decision tonight. Um, you can hold that decision later. This is really just to gain access. The only reason I bring it up is because if you really felt strongly not to do it, now's the time to to sort of Mr. Chair? make that position. Yes. Um, Tom, if, uh, if we leased it to them, would we then end up being able to collect property taxes on that property? Ooh, that's a good question because I right probably, now it's not property taxed at all because it's our property. Yeah, I don't think so because they're a political subdivision. Oh, sure. So okay. I don't think that would be taxable. One of the things to caution you on the lease versus sale is, especially for sewage infrastructure and industrial operations and those kinds of things, you may not want to take the liability. It might be best yeah. if you just outright sold a portion or all of it or you know whatever they might need yeah. uh, to absolve yourself of any potential liability for the site or it's management or operation or that kind of stuff too. Okay. Good question though. Yeah. I do remember Dick talking about that way better to sell than to yeah. lease. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess maybe I'll just ask, is, is there anyone that's opposed to the idea of Northern Township doing this? I, I don't think that there is. So, so what, what is the, you've talked to, to Dick, what is, is there any, uh, has there been say on our part to to go along with this plan? I don't. I don't believe so. Uh, Dick's here. We, the, I the, hear question. Uh, is there any downside to going with the plan of of selling this selling the property? Thank you. Not not that I can see. You know, I kind of talked to Tom a little bit and just mentioned that we are going to need a few months because whether we sell five acres or ten acres or a forty. We'd like to cut all the, you know, remove all the timber, or at least a portion of it off of there. And that's going to take a little time. So we just, I just wanted to caution the board and Northern Township that you just can't walk in with the check and try to buy it in a day. It still has to go through the the process because I, the DNR had said that even though you're selling to a township, you'd have to go through the process. Sure. So thanks, Thank you. Jack. So with that, I'd entertain a motion to approve the access and soil boring permit with Northern Township and authorize the staff to sign the permit. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. What would the impact of uh, bike trail? The location that they, it's a great question, Commissioner Gould, the, the location that they initially identified would be accessed on the very east side of the property, and the infrastructure, I'm told, uh, for the mechanical plan and stuff would be located kind of central, south, southeast, you know, sort of eastern side. So there'd be virtually no impact at all. We actually talked to them about making sure that we did everything possible to preserve a natural corridor so that you couldn't see through the site into this. Uh, they seemed agreeable to that. Uh, there will be a potential impact in getting under the trail because, of course, they have to bring their line around get underneath the trail one way or another. They're working with some property owners in and around the vicinity. So I don't know exactly the details of where they would bring it around, but there could be some potential impacts to trees and ground disturbance and stuff with the installation of the sewer line. But once all of that was done, uh, there really shouldn't be, I mean, you shouldn't really notice the, the facility at all. Any other questions, any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Allocation of opioid settlement dollars. Now the questions come. Now up. the questions come. Up. <laughs> the answers. And I'm ready. All right. Good, good evening, Commissioners. Amy Bowles, Public Health Director. I'm here to present to you tonight um, with a, a request to recommend some spending of our opioid dollars. So in January 2024, an RFP was released titled Call to Action and Remediation Uses for Settlement Dollars. The intent of the RFP was to allow our Beltrami County partners to apply for opiate settlement funds to support the work of their organization and expand or improve their services. The Opiate Steering Committee is recommending opiate funding be distributed to the applica applicants listed in your Exhibit A. 
The attached exhibit gives the commissioners an overview of the Beltrami County Opiate Steering Committee's recommendations. Uh, we request, um, we being the Opiate Steering Committee, that Beltrami County commissioners approve distribution up to um, the funding amount of $146,000 for opiate settlement dollars to support the RFP applicants. Um, if you would like me to review that um, table in your handout, I sure can. Well, I think one of the questions that I had was how many how many people applied for this? And then how, so how many people are, are not getting anything? Yes, we had 10 applicants and five of them um, are being recommended to receive a portion of funding. And is there a reason why the other five weren't considered? I, mean, I don't know who they yeah. are, but I was just curious. Yep, yeah, that's a great question. So what we did is a, um, our committee had a scoring process. So we, and that scoring tool was given in the application. So the applicants would have an idea of what their scoring would be based on. And then the committee recommended, I made a motion internally, our process will be to look at allocating $140,000 every year of opiates um, of opiate funds to be used. 50% of that will be used to support um, county services and 50% of that would go out in RFPs. And so what we did is over the course of the last two years, if you take the amount that we received in 2022 and 2023, we assured that we were not spending over that um, it would be $70,000 per year, so $140,000 um, <clears throat> over the course of the two years. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll stop with that for my first part of the answer, unless you want more. No. <laughs> and so would you like some dollar amounts? Is that? It's at 70,000 a year and it's 146,000 that you're asking for. Where's the other 6,000? Yep. So if you remember, commissioners, you approved early on in this process that we could use um, or that we should allocate 15% every year to youth funds. If you look at the five applicants, um, most of them are very heavily supporting youth funds. And so the 15% per year that we would spend in allocating towards youth funds wouldn't even, um, so if you take out that we would spend about $63,000 um, <clears throat> in the two years, right, for youth funds, because that would be 15% of what we received. If you take that 63% off the 146 that we're requesting, then you're not even left with us hitting that seventy thousand dollars for RFP funds. So we're the youth fund portion of it. So yep. that makes it a little, a little more palatable. Well, it just makes it more understandable. You know, otherwise sure. you pay seventy thousand twice is one hundred forty, and we're doing one hundred forty-six. You know, bringing the youth thing into it just makes makes it more understandable. Yes. How close of an allocation? to the requests are these. So in other words, um, if you're giving um, 50,000 to Stellar, did they ask for 50? Did they ask for 150? I'm just curious. I'm... That's a great question. And I can give you those dollar amounts if you want exact dollar amounts. Gotcha. But we have, um, Stellar did ask for 50. Um, NWI CDC did ask for 40, it was like 45,000. And then North Holmes asked for, uh, it was close to 30, 35, 38,000. The drug court asked for 25,000 and ours to serve House of Hospitality asked for 38,000, I believe. Okay. It's Joe, go ahead. Mr. Chair, could you remind me uh, a little bit about uh Face It Together's application and what their request was? Yeah. So Face It Together had two primary um, requests for funding. And in their application, one of those, um, one of those requests was to support um, a van that would be mobile and um, go around the community and park in high, known high use places and distribute Narcan. Um, they were requesting about $20,000 for that. And then the remainder of the funding, they were asking for education and supporting salary, I do believe. Not the wrong folder. And how much was that second amount? Um, 
Let me get you an exact amount so that way I'm not giving you the wrong amount. Face it together. Okay. So face it together was asking for fifty thousand dollars. And they wanted twenty thousand dollars for supplies, which included clean needles, cotton balls, distilled water, and ten thousand dollars for mileage reimbursement for traveling and training. And then they wanted an additional twenty thousand dollars for the van that they wanted to purchase. Yep, um, because we'd use the scoring process. And so each of the applicants received a score based on how well they answered a question or how, how well they um, met one of the, cri the criteria found in the application that were also aligned with the MOU. And that's a huge portion or a huge piece of what came down to the final five is um, I took the time to compare each applicant to the MO, um, MOA that the state has given us and said the funding has to go to these causes. And so based on the, the recommendations from um, our community, remember we did two listening sessions. And so part of our job is to get feedback from our community partners. And then we took that feedback and our committee of the individuals who are experts in each of their areas, they took that information and then they looked at their top three areas that they feel Beltrami County has needs in supporting. And then we also looked at the scoring process. And so we took um, the applicants that scored well and met the requirements of the MOA. And we looked at what we could financially support um, with the, that 140,000 that we want to set for ourselves for a budget. And the reason that we're using that $140 is because if you take the estimated amount of what we're supposed to receive over the course of the next 18 years, and you divide that by 18 years, it comes to out to about $157,000. So if we give ourselves a financial budget of 140 per year to spend, then we know that we'll have some money to put towards this this pandemic, this uh, you know epidemic of, um, of 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 anyway, I don't have to explain it to you. Anyway, we will have money to spend over the next eighteen years. I think I need supper. <laughs> so, so, are you anticipating um, every year you'll do a, a seventy? A, a... That's what we're hoping to do. Now, mind you, like sometimes the funding might not come in. Just half hour ago, I got a, an email that said some of our some of the funding sources and how that money is changing and what we were anticipating how much we we're getting so we were setting that 140 based on what we're anticipating getting knowing that that could change every year joe did, did you have any other follow-ups joe tim did you have a question yeah i had a, a couple of questions uh, thank you mr chair so um you mentioned that basic you know requested some funding for for transportation right uh, to buy a van, correct? Okay. Yes, and so then I'm just kind of curious, um, what kind of enhancing transportation is that we're going to provide that may be different from from place it together. Um, well, Stellar may not be providing transportation. I'd have to go down. Okay, I was just wondering because it, in, in the the funding allocation for enhancing transportation, so. Yep, some of the funders that we're choosing to support um, are in, um, are enhancing transportation by providing um, services to um, attend their support groups, to go to their counseling sessions, um, to um, trying to think of other uh, to get to medical appointments, um, or. Um, maybe even to to get to like treatment centers or to facilities that um, are providing um, medication assisted therapy. So I imagine that uh, during these committee um, meetings that there has been a lot of uh, difficult you know discussions on on trying to outweigh what services uh, to support and, and um, not support. Um, you know, and I commend the committee and, and their work in uh, reading through you know all these applications. Um, 
as, as I did attend, you know, a few committee meetings. Um, but I'm also curious about uh, the drug court uh, enhancing staff training and recover and some sobriety supplies. What kind of, did they mention what kind of staff training that they might be receiving and, and how, how is, how, how does a, uh, the state of Minnesota able to, you know, apply for, for these types of things and, and is the court, um, submitting applications to other counties that, you know, that they serve as well? I, I don't know. Uh, great questions, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. So um, being new to the county, I'm still learning about some of the services that we provide. Um, and if, if Ann has uh, additional support that she can provide, I definitely would welcome her. But what I can, can tell you is that the drug court um, is for the residents of Beltrami County, and that's why that funding would be perfect to fit for them. It's not, even though it's operation, like the name is Minnesota, state of Minnesota, sh this individual that that works with individuals that are coming through the drug um, treatment court system, um, she is solo person working on this case. You know, she does have a couple of, of team members that support her, you know, like the judge and, and a couple other people, but <clears throat> Um, she's completely funded by grants and her, her grants are running out. So she's not even asking for funding to support um, like her position. She's just asking for funding to help to support the individuals that have opiate addiction. But with this, I imagine that uh, you guys have some sort of criteria for, for um, outcomes, uh, measurable outcomes. Do you, well, what do you have in place for, for that? That's a, a great question too. So the state actually has a very robust re re report that I have to fill out every um, at the beginning of every year on the work that we did um, the year prior. And in that work, it, it does ask us for information regarding like population served, what activities that we were engaged in and um, uh, the number of people impacted, the race and ethnicity, um, uh, if we used any evidence-based models, um, trying to think what else. And then it also breaks it down into like the specific areas as far as like, was this leadership and development? So educating and training um, the, the individuals who are working directly with boots on the ground is appropriate for the, the opiate funding um, when you're asking about the education and training. And earlier you were mentioning something <clears throat> You mentioned uh, that the opioid money, 50% is going to the remaining, was it 75% of, of that? 50% of that is going to the county and 50% is going to the community, right? Correct. Well, I'll take $140,000. 50% of that, so 70,000 we would like to allocate um, to community services or community partners. And then 70,000 of that will um, support community or county services that are um, directly working with opiate addiction. So one, one example would be Amanda. So you know how you guys approved um, us to take uh, fifteen percent to support Amanda's program. That will come out of out of our under that our fifty percent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Did you? With that, would you like us to pass? I would. I would. If someone might like make that motion. A second. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, offer an amendment that would uh, um, take ten thousand to establish fifty thousand and put uh, make that forty thousand and put ten thousand for together transportation, Narcan distribution. And Is there a second to that amendment? Carol, second that amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? 
Oh, that's pretty self-explanatory. I think they check a lot of the boxes. You know, you just look at their mission, you look at the committee's mission, you know, it's tough. Uh, so, encourage support. Mr. Chair, I just, I feel like it, we're undermining the committee and the work that they did and the scoring, you know, what, uh, what kind of worms are we opening if we just arbitrarily go and and change this at this point, then the other four that were of the 10, uh, you know, applicants, what are they, you know, how, how is that equitable to them? I just don't see that at this point in this game, we can do this. So well, I'm not in favor sure. of it. You certainly can do this. Both Tim and I were part of this group, uh, part of the committee and, and uh, others on the committee that expressed support for uh, spacing together. Generally speaking, um, and you know, they didn't um, uh, speak to their support. Uh, ultimately, they did not make it into the uh, overall uh, from the overall committee. Um, but there certainly still was uh, uh, at least general support for the organization. Any further discussion? Well, Mr. Chair, you know I. I know that the the committee, you know, knows and understands that. Uh, the county board has has the final say, so I don't I don't know or or feel that the committee would be you know upset about you know the the decision to um, reallocate some of these funds. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. aye. Roll call, Commissioner Sumner? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? No. Commissioner Goswig? No. Commissioner Gould? Yes. Commissioner Carlson? No. It just, the amendment fails. So we're back to the original motion of the allocation the way the committee recommended it. Question. Okay, question's been called. All those in favor say aye. No. Aye, opposed? think we have it. Anything else, Amy? Anybody else have anything for Amy? Moving Thank on to... For your time. Moving on to a resolution, and I think there was a... Uh, something was missed on here that needed to be added. The, the resolution to approve the commissioner assignments and per diem policy, that had just gotten accidentally left off so that the heading on that resolution should say the board by adoption of its consent and actually in this case its regular agenda approve the resolution to approve the commissioner assignments and per diem policy as laid out Here. yes table this second motion's been made and second to table any discussion uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, once an item has been moved to table, there's no discussion allowed. Very good. Roll call vote. Commissioner Sumner. Yes. Commissioner Anderson. No. Commissioner Gosvig. No. Commissioner Gould. Yes. Commissioner Ga uh, Carlson says no. Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion that we approve the resolution to um, approve the resolution of, for the uh, commissioner assignments and per diem policy. And if you want it read or not, you, you would, would you like it read? I don't, I don't no, believe we it. We don't need it read. All right. We just want to be clear as staff, you're approving, your motion is to approve the resolution, the new committee assignments that's been worked out in the and work the, session. And the per diem policy. The per diem policy. Yes. So all three of those documents. Correct. Okay. There a second? Second. Discussion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, amend the motion to update the following committees, uh, make each of them eligible for PDM and expenses Beltrami HRA, ICAP, Black Dust Ambulance, Budget Committee, County Extension Committee, 
Bench Committee, Headwaters Regional Development Board, Dale Related Committees, Pritchagani Regional Library Board, Land Review Committee, Law Library Board, Mississippi Headwaters Board, Negotiation slash Mediation Committee, Newsletter, Opioids, Planning Commission, Solid Waste and Shaft, as well as uh, any committees or subcommittees related to community health board. Also, the Midi Day at the Capitol and make our view. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. No discussion. We'll call a roll call vote. Commissioner Sumner. Yes. Commissioner Anderson. No. Commissioner Gosvig. No. Commissioner Gould. Yes. Commissioner Carlson says no. Amendment fails. Moving on. Mr. Chair, so, I'd like to offer an amendment uh, to uh, increase the tier one for EM from $75 and the tier two to $100. Is there a second? Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion. Mr. Chair. Um, so I guess I'm assuming that tier one currently is the $50? Correct. And the tier two is the 75? Correct. Okay. I guess I wasn't uh, aware that we had a tier system until I read this, so I wasn't. So it's this is not allowed by law? to be able to increase during the year. It can only be increased at the beginning of January 1st. So the, we can decrease it, but not increase. You it. can decrease, but not increase. So the amendment's out of order. Any other discussion? Hearing none, let's have a roll call vote on this, on the- Approving of the resolution. Yes. Commissioner Sumner. Yes. No. Oh, he's the, uh, for, no, this is approval of the resolution. Oh, I thought my, they, my original motion. Oh, thought, no, I, that was out of order. That was out of order because oh, we okay. cannot legally do it. Oh no, Commissioner Anderson. I'm sorry, which, this I'm is on. This is on approving the resolution of of our the changes that we made tonight. Commissioner Gosvig. Yes. Commissioner Gould. No. Commissioner Carlson says yes. The motion passes. The resolution is in order. The, the legislative motion. Oh, sorry. Legislative and lobbying issues. Commissioner Sumner. Well, Mr. Chair, um, I know I know that uh, our Health and Human Services Director has been down to the uh, legislature uh, lobbying uh, quite frequently, and I want to commend her for her efforts. I can't re uh, recall what uh, what it is exactly that she was um, testifying. On, on behalf of the county, I believe. Um, and maybe if uh, Tom can update, a quick update on what, what that is, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Sumner. Uh, we've been working behind the scenes to advance uh, legislation that would absolve the county of a $336,000 bill that we were charged. Um, for the by the failure of the state to move certain client into a facil state run facility, um, that's been on the plan for the last year or so. Uh, we were able to get that legislation sponsored in both the house house and the senate side, and so we've been testifying on that. Anne's been the one kind of leading the, the outward testimony. We'll be working with our lobbyists and and certainly internally on these issues. I'm pleased to report that both of those pieces of legislation have made it into the omnibus bills. Uh, so we're really pleased about that. We're hopeful that that gets passed. And if it does, it'll finally put to rest the issues that we had with the state in regards to this outstanding bill that we feel is extraordinarily unfair um, and have called out. And we want to thank also uh, Senator Green for his uh, unwavering support and leadership on this particular issue. He's done a, a fantastic job representing uh, the county on this particular issue. So with that, Mr. Chair, I just want to again acknowledge uh, Anne for for her uh, willingness to go testify. Richard, 
Anything? Uh, extension. Just the fact that we have trouble in, in the issue of hiring people and keeping our wages up. And apparently the state has as well, because the staff ed person, they've had to uh, run this through. This is our third time trying to find somebody that's willing to take the job at the cost of the amount that they're paying us. And it's, it's a huge region as well. And another one would be the mental health presentation that I requested is already, I guess, on the docket. So that'll be coming. I think you'll find that in there. Good. Greg? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. We had the JASB meeting, as you were aware of, um, and we set the public hearing for May 9th at the airport at five o'clock, I believe. And uh, so that's coming up uh, to review the custom zoning that we have come up with as a local government units. Um, I had went, participated in the assessor interviews and I'm glad to see that we're hopefully going to have um, promotion from within for that. Had a fair board meeting last night and um, they're getting more youth involved with 4-H and, and stuff um, and, the, and the, you know, enter, entering for the fair. And so that's really good to see. And then had a solid waste committee meeting this morning and uh, we're looking at the um, Re-looking at the the roof for the solid waste transfer station, it's you know you know got leaking issues and and basically no insulation, and so gonna revisit that and look at uh, getting up to date bids and see where those come in at. That's my report. Joe, I'm um, just wanted to share some good news as far as the uh, rail corridor update. Uh, you might have seen that YMC. I YMCA out of uh, Cass and Clay counties has agreed to uh, uh, help um, Greater Bemidji and uh, uh, the city and others uh, partner with, uh, um, you know, uh, the creation of a, a YMCA in the in the wellness corridor. So that was a, a really good uh, update to learn about over the weekend. Um, the only uh, committee related item is uh, I attended uh, Association of Minnesota Counties. Uh, leadership training uh, down in Niswa. And uh, there was a, a really good uh, uh, presentation regarding uh, uh, board synergy. Um, that's it. Um, I was with you at Prime West and with you at uh, Extension, with you at JASB. Nothing else to report. Mr. Chair. Moved. Uh, I guess I didn't know we were onto the commission's reports as well. Uh, I, maybe I should have known. But um, I just want to uh, remind folks that there's an open house uh, April 24th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, for the Beltrami County Workforce Impact. And also, I want to uh, remind uh, my colleagues here that it is uh, Public Safety Hill Communicators Week. Our, our 911 dispatchers. Um, Provide a lot of services, you know. When when you know they're our first uh, first responders, when when you know, people are in crisis or an emergency, you know they often you know talk you know people through their their crisis or or get them help. So I just want to acknowledge that their work, you know, they're they're the unsung unsung heroes when it comes to our our public safety, you know, um, um, officers and, and uh, first responders. So. That, thank you. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.